Welcome to The Actor's Choice, where the actors and actresses have a chance to talk about themselves and their careers. Join us now for the next hour as we explore the marvelous industry of acting by actors and actresses from today's exciting show business world. And now, direct from Hollywood, here's your host, Ron Brewington. Hi, everybody. I'm Ron Brewington, and welcome to The Actor's Choice. Roll it, Tony. I'm Cheryl Bridgewater. And I'm Beryl Hawkins. And we, we are, are the Bridgewater Sisters. Sisters. And this is Our Life in Japan. I think it was a process. It wasn't something that happened overnight. I think it was a series of events because we almost grew up in Asia in, in the sense that we went to high school in India. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you didn't see doubles. Those are two beautiful ladies. They're twins. My first guest today comes from the far eastern country of Japan. I've known this lady for a long time as we both have a lot in common, one of which is that we both are a twin. She's here today via modern technology to talk about what she's been up to and what's on her plate. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Burl Hawkins. Burl, hello, hello. It's such a pleasure to be here, Ron. Thank you so much for the Wouldn't have it any other way. Wouldn't have it any other way. Welcome to the Actors Choice. And isn't this technology off the hook? Well, um, that's how we met originally through through technology, yes. Mm -hmm. After all these years, I'd heard a lot about you through your brother, Rudy. Rudy okay. Brewington. Are you going to tell them our secret? Uh, I have to, unfortunately, I have to let it to him. I, I didn't have your number. He gave me your number just moments ago. <laughs> no, I mean, the secret of um, the fact that I'm a twin and you're a twin. Okay, I'm <laughs> UG and he's LY. <laughs> 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 so ugly, he got the UG, I got the LY. So, you, know. <laughs> you always say that. <laughs> <laughs> if the shoe fits, wear it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the Brewington brothers and the Bridgewater sisters. My God, you, oh, you, you know, it's interesting. People don't understand when you're a twin, people ask you dumb questions like, if I hit you, will your brother feel it? Right. Oh, <laughs> get, oh. Does your sister feel it? Yes. <laughs> does she get sick too? No, so we have, yes, we've had quite a few yes. <laughs> rounds about that. <laughs> yes. Another round that we have from time to time is that the question is as twins, who's going to die first and how the other one's going to take it? Okay, we'll leave that one for later. later. <laughs> I, get your, I get your drift. Okay, you probably respond to this question quite a lot. Why Japan? Well, um, that's an excellent question because I was back in the late 80s, I was huh? ready to leave New York. I'm sorry, I know you're from New York, but I was ready to leave. And I put three cities on the table. One was Tokyo, one was LA, and one was Chicago. So I decided to try Tokyo first because my parents lived here. Okay. And if that didn't work out, Ron, I was coming out your way to LA. <laughs> oh, God, look what we missed out on. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes. So that's, and it worked out. Some years later, I'm still here. <laughs> Now, as yeah. the world knows, the Tokyo Olympics are coming in a few weeks, uh, Friday, July 23rd to Sunday, August 8th. It looks like it's going to be a very controversial Olympics, huh? It looks like it's going to be very unpredictable. And, you know, that's the case for all Olympics, really. Um, and it's a roller coaster, really. I mean, one day, you know, the stadium capacity is half. The next, the next day, no fans at all. You know, it's the planning and preparation for this kind of mega event that can be, um, well, certainly in the case of Tokyo, it's it's difficult, it's painful, it really is. And for the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, the Japan Olympic Committee, JOC, it's been just fraught with lots and lots of problems. You know, they're working under very dire conditions. And you know what? It's the fear of 90,000 Olympics staff, athletes, media descending on this city. It's really raises lots of fears, I think, in all of us. You know, like something simple as riding the train, you know, uh, that's 
makes everybody very nervous, you know, but it, it is a huge gamble, you know, and question is, will they pull it off? Um, if we look at Los Angeles, you had a very successful Olympics and you covered the Olympics. Yes, I did. Yes. And how was that? Any memorable it was, experiences? It had problems. It did have some parking problems and a few other, but for the most part, it was okay. Okay. Yeah. And that was a success. London. Yeah. Was James Bond and the Queen. <laughs> I'll never forget that one. And then, of course, Beijing was a coming out party for China. But, you know, I think we also have to remember that Tokyo had a very successful Olympic in 1964. And maybe it was so far back that a lot of people don't remember. It was kind of a coming out party for Japan, you know, uh, after the war, showing that, you know, recovery was really good for Japan. So we had one success. We're not really sure about this one, but let me say this. I think in the long run, we'll all be watching the events on television and internet. And maybe, you know, those um, experiences that we have when we're actually watching will help to perhaps um, dissipate or, or maybe we can push aside some of the fears that we're going through right now. As I know, Rudy and I, we love track and field. We just got finished having the, the, the trials here in America. We can't wait to see the performance and they get overseas. Can't and I'm gymnastics, um, oh, yes. Simone Biles and, oh, yes. Biles. and all, of the, all of the gymnasts, you know, from the past I've, I followed as well. So. The last one. Well. Yes. <laughs> Go back to the video that we opened up with. There you were. The t um, Tony, could you show that picture of the twins? Tell us about you and Cheryl Bridgewater. Oh, oh my. Well, <laughs> that was actually at the um, Indian Festival. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we go, to, we go to a lot of the um, African, Indian, Brazilian festivals in the parks here. It's, it's a way for us to really connect with a lot of international people who are living here. Gotcha. Um, and actually, we came together in 1987 to Japan. Uh, so it's been a an experience that we've um, shared and we've helped and supported each other. There have been some trying times, as you can imagine, you know, but working, <laughs> yeah, especially in the entertainment business, you know, and we've kind of navigated that together. We started out actually with some of our musician friends in New York, uh, gave us the names of some friends to look up in Tokyo when we arrived. And we did that. And then we started on the small, jazz club scene you know the jazz club scene was very vibrant yes uh, and it still is it still is so and then after that we went together a lot of a lot of this we went through together the um gospel wedding boom there was a long period when many japanese couples wanted to get married um with gospel music so a lot of us worked quite consistently you know during that period and then after that, I was um, a regular performer at the Foreign Correspondence Club. Um, and Foreign Correspondence Club, you know, so I'm hanging out with journalists and I'm performing. And so it was kind of like a, a good match for me at that point. And we came together. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do a lot of performances together, sometimes solo. Um, but we started out in... Um, performing in the Caribbean when we were still in New York. Yeah. So you guys like to sing. I got to, Tony, can you show that next slide? Here's a picture we, we took of you. Ah, oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Me in the rain. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Yes. We, uh, we've got, well, we've got a few moments, but you did come out with a video and I loved it. It's called The Light and the Color Granny Performance. Okay. You roll that one, Tony. This is you. The light and color play. granny. <laughs> color granny. She is plotting a world conquest using her excellent skills of coloring. 768 years old. She is in charge of K, which stands for black. Red Stewart, color granny's first servant. M stands for magenta, which also means red. Blue lad. That's beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you very much. Good performance. Great performance. Tell us, how does the cultural differences that you have in Japan impact on your career and your professional work? 
Well, that's an example. You know, that's the um, uh, the witch character. Yes. Uh, which is a very juicy, dramatic role. Um, if you think about starting with uh, the Wizard of Oz and then the Wiz on Broadway, and um, actually Dee Dee Bridgewater, who's my sister's sister-in-law, uh, she wanted Tony for that witch character, right? She, G, Dee Dee Bridgewater is a magnificent jazz singer and performer. And uh, this is an example of cross-cultural because the um, uh, writer and creator for this project was a Japanese broadcaster. And uh, it was originally a Japanese children's story. And he decided he wanted to do it in English to, to gain a wider audience. So that's how I ended up with this particular witch character. And then I did another witch character uh, in a children's musical. So that's what, three times? I'm really, I think I'm getting it now, <laughs> actually. Um, and then that in that particular musical, my sister and I shared the part of a witch. So for example, I would be downstage singing a song. And then as soon as I finished, she would appear uh, the, the light would, you know, uh, shine on my sister in the back of the audience. And it was, you know, that magic, but, you yes. know, yeah. yeah. And it was looking at the children's reaction. It was, it was just, some of them were scared. And then some of them were just, oh, you know, that kind yeah. of, yeah. Yeah. So, but, you know, we had to do everything to perfection, you know, every hair, everything had to be completely the same in the dressing room. So, uh, that, you know, and, and that was actually working, um, uh, our audience was Japanese children. And that was an interesting kind of cultural experience too. They're so warm and open, um, and as opposed to performing, you know, in jazz clubs and, and other venues, um, most of the audiences are quite, um, quite quiet and respectful. You know, which is good too, but it's different. You don't get much reaction. So that's something, a cultural difference that you have to really get, get I used to. I found a couple of photos that you, can you tell us, Tony, can you put, put them up one by one and show her what those are? Tell us what those are. Oh, that's um, getting back to my um, New Delhi days. Those are my New Delhi high school friends. You know, I went to high school in New Delhi and, and I was actually a, choreographer for the high school musicals yeah. back then. And also um, I was um, competing in the charter law piano competition. Uh, so that's what I brought to India, my um, uh, dancing and my piano skills. And so that that's why I think I was, that was kind of my comfort zone that I took there. And so that helped me to adjust. So I've had two cultural adjustments to India and then also to Japan, but it's all in Asia. So in, in that sense, it's, you know, there's this symmetry there that I've been I'm quite used to. Tony, how about the next photo? Oh, okay. Those are the performers in, um, uh, in Japan. Uh, musicians, uh, singers, uh, whom that I've worked with, you know, on, in some, you know, for some gigs and, uh, just a very eclectic, <laughs> very eclectic group. Cause we're from all over, all over the States, you know, nice. and, uh, it's, um, it's been quite an, quite an experience, you know, we help each other, we support each other and, you know, and, and that's, and that's really good. You know. got a cut here of you talking about what's it like for you traveling all over Asia. Run it, Tony. Felt like we were coming back home. I think in the beginning, we really weren't sure exactly which direction we were going to go in, you know, having a background in pop and gospel and certainly very strong um, background in jazz and coming to the Japanese market. You know, you, I think with the versatility, you're able to, um, perform in different kinds of venues. You know, we've done a lot of, of course, the wedding singers. And then of course we do a lot of um, clubs and all, you know, that's the thing about Japan is that you get a chance to do a variety of the different kinds of shows. Wow. I went to high school wow. uh, at the American- When I see twins, uh, sad being when I had, uh, I had a set of twins, then unfortunately they passed away. Uh, but, uh, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. 
Yeah. The twin, I've to always have a twin is something I've always wanted. Oh, we got a couple more minutes. Just want to ask you a question. Um, you're an educator now here in Japan. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Um, you know, the whole um, publish or perish, you know, yeah. that's what university professors kind of live by. Well, I decided I was going to publish. So um, quite naturally, um, media research is something that, you know, is comes very natural to me. So I decided, okay, I'm in Asia, so let's, you know, research about, you know, uh, Asian uh, socioeconomic issues. And of course, the Tokyo Olympics was one of them that I focused on about four or five years ago. Yes. Well, goodness gracious, time goes by when you're having fun, I suspect. Oh, no. <laughs> we only gave you 17 minutes, unfortunately. Take care. Good Thank to see you. you. And we'll catch you around the alley, as they say. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ron. And it's been fun. Ladies and gentlemen, Burl Hawkins. This is the Ox's Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. And if you have a product or a service or an upcoming event that you'd like to see advertised on this program, please call us at 323-533-1036. It's 323-533-1036. Prices are very affordable. We want to thank you. Roll it, Tony. Am I here? Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest is a dynamic lady who has worked continuously for 46 years in motion pictures, television, and definitely on the stage. And she carries a strong last name. What you just saw is a clip of what was probably her most well-known film role, the 1971 film, Harold and Maude. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome actor, director, and artistic director of Will Gears, Theatricum Bodicum, Miss Ellen Gear. Miss Gear, welcome to the Actors' Choice. Hello, how are you? I'm great, my dear, great. When your publicist, uh, Lucy Pollock, yes. told me that you were coming on our show, I went, yes! Very <laughs> pleased to have you here as a guest. We definitely will say, come back again, definitely. <laughs> nice. Let's start with your family, ma'am. Tony, would you please show the next four slides? <laughs> What you're seeing here, the first person, of course, is your father. Will That's Gear. Papa. <laughs> That's Papa. <laughs> the next person that we see is your mother. That's right. Through the wear. <laughs> yes. Oh, what a family. What a family. But it don't stop there, ladies and gentlemen. Go to the next slide, would you please, Tony? <laughs> your daughter, oh, Willow Gear. Yes. I see red hair runs in the family. And she's just about to be, have my sixth grandchild. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. And one more, Tony, if you would. A little hard. I put a hat on her. The picture that I chose for the next slide, Tony, is uh, we put a, a picture so people would see that red hair. That's Megan. That's your daughter. That's Willow. Yes. <laughs> Couldn't have it no other way, madam. Couldn't have it no other way. Yeah. Of, of all your children, you have to, okay, how many daughters you got? I have two daughters and one son. Is the son going to be an actor? Oh, Ian Flannery, oh, he, I couldn't have uh, had the theater go without his help. He does all the graphic design and everything. And, and my other daughter, my older daughter, she's an artist. She does uh, stained glass and pottery and yeah. Yeah, yes. got a wonderful family. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> say that you are the family is an understatement. an understatement. Now, folks, let me tell you something about this lady. This lady has nearly 140 INDB actor credits. And that's a lot of auditions. <laughs> that's a lot of auditions. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Goodness. Yes. When I read your resume. Oh. Yeah, I've been working for a long time. I, I started when I was knee high to a grasshopper. Okay, I'll try that. I like that line. I'll, like I'll, I'll use that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it's wonderful. And but they, I'm not, you know, it's harder now in this day and age to make a living doing theater. But most of my work has been theater. And then I was blessed to have some years on television and uh, learned a lot, met a lot of wonderful people. And now I just love running Theatricum Botanicum, which means theater of plants. Yes. Say uh, uh, a few plays, like I said, you had almost 140 actor credits. That's a lot of work. I know, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yes. The year was 1971. You got your first IMDb actor credit playing the role of Susan in a TV series called Play of the Week. You were 20 years old. <laughs> I know. I know. I was very, very lucky. Yes, I've been lucky. I've been able to work and make a living in the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You've done a lot of research. I think you probably know more about what I did than I can remember. Well, you have to understand, ma'am. I would be, when I'm talking to a lady of your quality, <laughs> of what you've been through, what you have forgotten, and some folks haven't even learned yet. I would be wrong if I didn't come here with my stuff together. Thank you. Okay, I'm honored to be happy as a guest. Thank, thank you. you so much. I noticed that when I was going through your record, uh, I noticed that you did a lot of TV series. You got a lot of them. In yes. fact, you did 75 of them. Yeah. Oh. Yes. I kept working, you know. <laughs> yes. Yes. You worked virtually almost every year since you first got in mm -hmm. to now. I'm very lucky. I, I know how to hustle. When you need to make a living yes, and bring up your family, you hustle. <laughs> Do the hustle. Do the hustle. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. If somebody says to you, can you ride a horse? You say, yes, I can. And then you go learn how so you can get the job. <laughs> Fast forward to 1972. You got picked up to do a role in the famous TV series, The Waltons, with your father. Yeah. That oh, was about that, please, man. What was that like? Uh, it, it was a blessing because I loved Earl Hamner, who wrote the series. You know, he was such a real human being who cared about family values. You know, it wasn't uh, something that he just checked in on. He was truly a family person. Of uh, He was real Americana. And, and and having Pop on that show, and, and so I got to go on the show twice, which was great. So did my brother, Thad Gear, who is an actor. And uh, so it's good. It's good. And the second time you went back was in 1980. See, you know. <laughs> I to learn. What was it like trying to get roles back in those days? What was it like? Um, well, it's so different now because they have this Zoom world, you know, and people are yes. auditioning and they, they want you to become really good at cameras and what have you to send it in. It was wonderful. I've always loved auditioning. I've never understood why actors as they get older, they, they won't, they refuse to audition. I think you always have to go out because producers, you know, they're, they're younger and they don't know who the heck you are. So it's always important to audition and it keeps your chops up. Yeah. Right. And notice that you were born in a city so nice, they named it twice. A city so pretty, they called it New York City. That's right. That's born right. and raised in New York. Yeah, New York. And then my father, who is a hortic was a horticulturist as well as uh, an actor, we've got a farm out there in West Nyack. And uh, so he would always go in and in, into town, but we had this wonderful farm with pigs and he was a great gardener. Yeah. It's scared the reason I say that because I too was born in New York City. Oh, you were? Yeah. I, was, I lived uptown at home. I was oh, born there. That's great. And last night I happened to see Bruce Springsteen. He, the boss, a.k.a. the yeah. boss. Yeah. They're opening up theaters on Broadway now. Isn't, isn't that something? Isn't that something? I know. It, it's very exciting, you know, when we, we were having some classes at the theater after this COVID and some of the actors would get up there and one of them just started to recite Hamlet and then burst into tears because they were so happy to be on the stage and, and you know, doing what they have, you know, blessed their life for. And uh, that was good. It's good. I hope we stay 
healthy in this country, yeah. get vaccinated. <laughs> Skia, you and I don't know each other. In fact, we're just meeting for the first time, but I'd like to ask you some advice. Oh, they're coming to get me. Some uh -oh, advice uh -oh. about what really bugs me. This is something that really bugs me about this industry. What? People come here to Hollywood with illusions of grandeur. I want to be a star. Okay, you want to be a star. That's great. They will, they'll do film. They'll do TV. But they won't touch the stage. Your thoughts, madam? Well, to me, the stage is the root of it all. It really is. And and you will find, even especially if you do Shakespeare, you find that if you can if you can do the classics and interpret these roles, that suddenly TV, film, everything else becomes easy because uh, uh, the humanity in Shakespeare is quite extraordinary. And so you begin to really understand human beings in, in any era, how they work, how they function. And you can translate it because the simplicity of some of the film and TV scripts become so simple then. I, I really feel that actors need to, it, it's just like a musician. I feel musicians, if you're gonna be a jazz musician, whatever kind of musician, you gotta know the source of what you're doing. And to me, the theater is the source. It's the community where you build friendships, actors, and you really learn how to do it. <laughs> Glad you said that because before we run out of time, let's talk about your favorite subject. They call it Triticum Botanicum. It's Theatricum okay. Botanicum. My father always, you know, it was always Latin. It's Theater of Plants. <laughs> you show that first slide for us. So there it is right there. There's the, there's the sign right there. There it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Is. Can you tell us about uh, what was, how did your father start this stadium? Yes. Well, it's an outdoor theater. Yes. It's under the California Live Oaks, which is a very rare forest now. And yes. he always said that the reason that the oaks remain so beautiful in this area, the water comes down from the Sierra. It's very green in the canyon where everything else is quite brown now, you know, with the climate change. And we, he started that theater after he was blacklisted uh, during the MacArthur era. And we all went up there and in order to make a living, we sold plants when I was a kid. And, and it became a home for all the blacklisted actors. Because if you're an actor, you, you've, gotta, you've gotta be able to exercise, you know? And you have to do it outside in people. You know, if you're a cellist and you're blacklisted, you can still play the cello. But an actor has to emote. So it was an extraordinary thing that he created there. And then our family grew up and we all went out and made a living. And then we came back when he became Grandpa Walton. And suddenly he was the cherry pie of the world rather than the bad man. And we created the theater, Theatricum Botanicum. And it's been going for over 45 years. Ooh. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, we really dug in our roots and it healed us this place. And now we're a professional theater with our union. We're putting on this year, Julius Caesar, and we're putting on a Midsummer Night's Dream and a brand new play. There's a new author named John Guerra. You're gonna hear about him. He wrote a play called Last Best Small Town. And it's about a Latinx family and a white family living together and how they function in a small town. It, it has the humanity of our town, written by Thornton Wilder. So it's going to be a marvelous piece. He's a lovely young writer. We're excited. Got a clip. It's about the family bonds that you have with that, that organization. Roll it to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Oh, what we say again? Nestled into Panga, carved into the canyon itself, is a theater, rustic and wild, rich in history and carefully cultivated by several generations of one family tree. For decades, audiences have entered this space, sat under the stars, and found themselves utterly transported. There's something about going to a play and feeling the same emotions together. You can't get that from Netflix. You can't get that from... Well, this little clip we got from a local TV station, and there's you in that film talking about how this theater is what it is today. Uh, Tony, can you show that next uh, scene that we have? Okay, there's a picture taken from the venue. Yes, looks at home. That's a home, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't that oh. beautiful? Oh, 
Gosh. You got to come out here. Get out of New York, wherever you are and come visit. Okay, I'll take that as an invitation. Yeah, Tony, can you go to the next one, please? Now here is, I asked him to put this one because it, it has a sign and the telephone number, 310-455-3723. You know what I did yesterday around noonish? What? I called that number. <laughs> and guess what? You see, it? it's all crafted. I crafted that sign. Did you now? It's a wood, you know, wood yes. carving. Yes. <laughs> Would you believe someone answered the phone? Of course they did. We have a box office. <laughs> <laughs> Answer the phone. <laughs> wow. wow. Oh, we, we're running out of time, but we got one more video. I just want to show it real quick. Okay. This is you playing Long Day's Journey into Night. Mm. Roll it, Tony. Yeah. First mm -hmm. after breakfast cigar of its own woodman. This match have the right mellow flavor. I got them dead cheap, too. They were a great bargain. McGuire put me onto them. Oh, I hope he didn't put you onto a new piece of property at the same time. His real estate bargains don't work out so yeah, well. I wouldn't say that. He's the one that advised me to buy that place on Chestnut Street. I uh, made a quick turnover on it for yes, a fine profit. Yes, I know. The famous one stroke of good luck. There. That is you and a gentleman by the name of Eugene yeah. Hill. And hopefully, you know, that's such a great play and that uh, stay off drugs. <laughs> Stay away from drugs. It can just wipe you out. You know, that's such a good play. Adam, can you tell us when does your season open up this year? It opens on July 10th and July 11th. It's going to run how long? We're going to run into probably the end of October, if God willing, COVID Don't doesn't rise. And the, right, right. Gotcha. Oh, no. You, what were you going to say? I said, you said, uh, thrill. I said, and the creek don't rise. That's right. The creek don't rise. <laughs> I'm from New York. We talk like that. That's right. <laughs> Indeed. That's lovely. Indeed. That's lovely. Uh, I have enjoyed these few moments with me. I will never forget them as long as I live. Well, you come out and see us and meet my Okay. Friends. I'm going to do that. I'm going to walk over to you. I said, do you know, have we met before? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it that way. Yeah. Nice to, nice to meet you. You are a lovely gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Ellen Gear. <laughs> Bye-bye. Brother Tony. How do you like my Abby? It must be quite a change for you. It's a big one. Malsen. Filósofo tropical. Tú conociste un tipo en un café y te fuiste a tomar una copa de vino con él. <risa> Tú sabes, yo tengo. Ladies and gentlemen, my next two guests, both writers and directors from Cuba, are here today to talk about a new film that these two filmmakers have put together. It's called The Last Rafter. You just got a chance to see a clip from this marvelous, marvelous movie. And so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Carlos Rafael Betancourt and Oscar Ernesto Ortega. Gentlemen, welcome to the Access Choice. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank wow. you very much for having yeah. us. Wow. They tell me this film that you guys have made is off the hook. Wow. I was going to say this yesterday. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's start with Carl. Uh, yeah. It, it's on HBO Max now. Um, yes. So everybody can watch it. And we're very, very happy to um, be able to share it now with the public after the very a good time. A long time. <laughs> yeah. We ran a festival, a pandemic, everything that had happened. Also, is it fun? Isn't it fun doing what you're doing now? This, this, this way you're getting out here talking to a lot of people. We call them junkets. Where you're getting people to popularize your work, the work that you guys did. Is that fun? right? Yeah. Okay. It, it, feels, it does. Yeah, it's, it's good. Yes, yes. Okay. How did you two guys first meet? We met back in Cuba. Um, like in more than 50, 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah we were teenagers. We were 14 years old. Yeah, yeah. We, we started with music. We actually uh, both played guitar yeah. at the time. We had a garage band. 
yeah. the name was T A L Tal. Yeah, in Spanish. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, we played music and started really building a creative relationship of yeah. you know doing music, writing the songs, crafting all that together, and that was probably the foundation of after that going yeah. to film school. That was the beginning, probably, yeah. of this uh, collaboration. Now. Uh, where yeah. are you at physically right now, as we speak? Where are you at now? We are in Miami, ah. Miami Beach. Yeah. And I got a little problem. Yeah, we're working on our uh, next project, actually, right now. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not just a regular movie. This is a multiple award-winning, groundbreaking film. Can you please tell us about the process, how HBO Latino acquired The Last Raptor? How'd they do that? Right. <laughs> it was a long journey, I think. We start first on, on Miami uh, International Festival. So we premiered there, and then we had the opportunity to be the open night of La Leaf, Los, Ange Los Angeles International Film Festival. And it was great. That, that was a, a, an amazing experience uh, on this festival because it had a, a good industry week, and we met a lot of agents. So I think the journey started from there. Yeah, 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 for sure. No, after that, um, La Leaf was, was um, amazing. The Los Angeles Latino International Film Festival, which was started by Edward James Olmos. Um, we were very, very grateful to open there and have a lot of industry uh, folks, agents, managers, um, acquisition executives, things like that, talking to us at a moment where you would do this regularly in a party. But that happened through Zoom because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So um, so it was good to connect with them. We stayed connected. And then after that, we followed up um, with, you know, as, as you regularly do. Yes. And it did happen. They did. They, they were interested in the film. They liked it. Um, and the rest of history. <laughs> yeah. Now, I understand that the film made history by having simultaneous screenings in Havana uh, and Miami at the same time. Correct. That was correct. Yes. No, it was, a, it was actually very um, rewarding for us. We got accepted at the Havana International Film Festival. At the same time, it was towards yeah. the end. Yeah, I know. It's great. And it was towards the end of the round of festivals. We opened mm -hmm. in Miami and we, towards the end, we went to Havana. And it was actually at the moment that the theaters were opening after the pandemic. So, um, so they wanted to show our film here in, uh, in a theater, in a landmark theater of the city called Tower Theater in Little Havana. And it was really, we shot around that place. So it had a lot of significance as well for us. And after that, we also showed the film at the Silver Spot in downtown Miami. Now, this is the first time after 60 years of political tension between Cuba and the United States. Uh, what's your thoughts about that subject? It's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I guess our film deals with it uh, in a you know in, in in some aspect of it at least uh, from the perspective of our generation, which is different mm -hmm. and it's a different kind of immigration probably than Cubans in, in in that had made also the fabric of the city and how it looks like in a way or like in a section of it, and we also wanted to explore that in the film as well so tense and complicated for sure but that's who we are you know we yeah. grew up in the middle of that <laughs> cannot avoid it as yeah. you know there are a lot of cubans here in los angeles and one of the restaurant if you haven't heard of, i'm sure you have Versailles. please yeah, go there sure. mr garcia puts on yeah. some very good food i've known him for a long long time i've enjoyed his food give me the black beans give me the plantains give me this give me that <laughs> And give me some. In fact, one day I just gonna come off the record here. He he used to sell a half a chicken for six dollars. And so one day I said, Mr. Garcia, I said, you know, you, you really charge more. I mean, this, this, we're getting all this for six dollars. So the next time I came back, you raised the price. I said, Mr. Garcia, I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> I was joking. That's great. There's uh, actually yeah. a percent here in in Miami. As yes, well. that's what I'm talking. Is is it? Yeah, it yeah, is yeah. he owner or does someone else own it? Oh, um, I don't know who the owner is. Yeah. And in, in, in LA, yeah. please stop by. Please stop by. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, for sure. I actually live in LA and there's also Portos, which is an awesome yeah. bakery there. Yes. Too. Yes. Now you guys are filmmakers, but not just filmmakers. You are Cuban filmmakers. What's the current status for filmmaking and production in Cuba? Hmm. 
No, yeah. our, our the hard times. Yeah, it, it's in, very yeah. hard. Yeah. It's very hard right now. The pandemic had hit really hard. Um, there's there is a lot of uh, complicated political yeah. uh, aspect going on, and there is censorship going on. We have friends that are back in Havana and are dealing with that. So um, yeah, it's it's a hard one. Now, and there's there's no money for production time. after yeah, all yeah. the opening, and you you know the Fast and Furious shot in Havana. So you can yeah. imagine it was a huge opening and people thought that it would become a hub for filmmaking but everything went back um you know at the turn of the administration with the whole the, the trump era and the closeness in cuba as well so we are i think we're further apart now more than in, yeah. than ever or like in the last 20 years yeah and that's sad because there's a lot of amazing filmmakers working in cuba they are amazing and they they don't have now the opportunity to work mm -hmm. so it's really sad mm -hmm. yeah. i asked that question yeah, we'll right at the end of the it felt it felt like that when you know when when all these other productions and bigger productions were going down to cuba but now everything is closed yeah. up again i asked that question because there are a lot of cubans who want to do what you do and they don't mm -hmm. need this they just want to be a filmmaker my goodness. Exactly. Tony, would you please show the next three slides? Can, tell me, can you look at these three slides and tell me what you see them? What do they mean to you? Okay, for sure. There's one right there. That's the, I believe that's the, the last raft to show some of the awards that you've won. Mm -hmm. That's the festival too. Those, all the festival runs and everything. Yeah, this one is the, the New York Latino yes. uh, Film Festival, yes. which was also sponsored by HBO. And it was great to celebrate there for sure. Yeah. That's photo. Now with this picture, I keep seeing this picture. Who is that guy? That <laughs> that's our main actor and lead, the amazing star, Hector Medina. Hector Medina, yeah. 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 It was the first day of the shooting of the principal photography. Yes. Yeah, that was in the first day. Yeah, in Sony Al, Florida. Yeah. And Hector was actually taking that huge leap of faith. He came from <laughs> Sundance, from the Sundance Lab, and got all these awards and had decided to stay in the US and try here a um, new life. He was actually coming after a longtime lover that became uh, his wife, and they have two beautiful kids now. So it's a, it's a beautiful love story. But he was actually just setting in Miami, starting to, to set foot here. Mm -hmm. And he jumped with us to do this, which was amazing. And also, also the character was living, you know, having an actor with so much traction and experience. Viva, which was his last film, went to Telluride. And um, a lot of, uh, uh, it was actually shortlisted for Academy Awards. Um, so it was a huge film. Um, yeah. And he just landed in, me, in Miami. Mm -hmm. So it was a good balance and mix because he was also tapping into his own experience for the character of Ernesto, who was a, a kid that just came on a boat in Miami, from, from Havana to Miami. So it was fusing all, all that um, reality that he was taking in to the character as well. Got you. Uh, next sli slide there, Tony. This one I keep saying, okay, HBO Max, and then there's the, there's the ball, the glass ball. Okay, all right, thank you. Now, <laughs> how, did that film, how did this film get the name The Rafter? What's a rafter? Rafter is the balsero in Spanish, yeah. the term that we use for the, for the people across the Florida Straits on the small boats, even though it doesn't have to be a raft per se, but it, it, it did. It was, you know, there were a lot of either very small motorboats or just um just just rafts without even an engine yeah, yeah. and usually they they use more rafts than boats than yeah, boats it's, it's easier boats. to to create a raft or to build it yeah, yeah. it is yeah. amazing and the last rafter it's because he was probably the last one uh we thought probably after after this change this po po political change uh probably on in in our film he was uh, the last one but for sure, no. Yeah, there's a lot of. Money. Yeah, and yeah. also it's part of the hint of the of yeah. the title of the film. It's like you would think there that nobody would come after that the political change that made Cubans not have not be able to claim political asylum anymore. But of course, it it does keep Still happening. happening. Yeah. You know, it won't it won't it won't change. So we knew that the whole that the film would subvert its title by the end of it, you know, and that, and it's part of it. We don't want to spoil it, but it's part of the experience of watching it. Where did you get the idea for the movie from? Well, when that policy actually was changing, Oscar started to write it, was, was um, working on a show here at the time. And I was at AFI at the American Film Institute. 
And he sent me the script and started working on it. Uh, Hector Medina actually really loved the story. Alina Rodriguez, our producer, who's now on Netflix, she um, really loved the story too. We started creating that core team. I joined them too. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's 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 where the... And, where... and we wanted really, really bad to make a, a film together. That yes. was the other thing. Yeah. 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 yeah, we wanted to. How, how much time you spend on uh, a five, two, two years, years probably? Yeah. And before that was like a five years. Yeah, three to five, four yeah. years without working together. So it yeah. was a, a very good reunion as well. That was awesome. I understand you cover a lot of universal subjects such as toxic masculinity, homophobia, discrimination, privilege and immigration. All these stuff you're talking about. Yeah, actually, it, it did happen very naturally in terms of like the character that is coming from Cuba and up against a very new world yes. that is trying to figure out. And that's the world we're living pretty much, you know, so just like th us thinking about what, what changes, what's your experience, what you're dealing with. And also growing up, you know, it's mm -hmm. part of, of coming of age and becoming a man and what that means in a world where the handbook for what a man is. It has been really handwritten in a way that now we're changing all that or rethinking all that. And that was part of ourselves exploration with the film as well. Take me back to that moment when the first time you showed your film to the public and you're standing in the back checking out their reaction. What was that like? It was amazing, actually. We were so nervously at that time. It was actually in, in, in Miami International Film Festival. Yes. But I think we had a lot of adrenaline inside us at, at that time. But but it was good. And 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 we we made this film without agents and uh, studios. So it was all by, by ourselves. So and with the help of many friends and of the some friends uh, in Miami, and they worked so hard. So it was really grateful to 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 show to present that film to everybody and say, hey, we did it. Here we are. Yeah. Finally, after all this uh, work, we, we have a film. And please yeah. come with us and, and watch it. Yeah, for sure. And sharing it with them, you know, it was that sh sharing it with the people that made it, sharing it in the city that it was shot. It was really, really beautiful. Uh, I checked your record. This is not your first film. So you, uh, you learned a lot from this, I'm sure. Yeah, no, yeah. We, we did learn a lot. We had done short films before, but this was our first feature film. Um, and now we're actually jumping into another project, a new project. And, uh, another feature film. Yeah, another I can say film. that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the publicists, Camille, she sent me a bunch of uh, slides. Can we take a look at that, Tony, the next couple, uh, and tell us what it's all about? This was taking while you guys were actually working. For sure. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's both of us. I don't know what's in the monitor. It, it was on, on Lane House, I think. Yes. Oh, probably. Yeah. yeah. That was a tight one. We were yeah. in a very tight space there and we were trying to cover a lot of ground. Yes. Of, um, yeah. Actually, yeah. It was, it was uh, the, back, the breakfast scene. Oh, and the yeah. breakfast scene. Yeah. It yeah. was there. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. yeah. I, actually, that, that scene is interesting because that, that scene is like, yeah, yes. it, it has a, a little callback to uh, Strawberry and Chocolate, Fresi Chocolate, which is a very iconic film that we, are, that we had as a reference to mm -hmm. um, in the writing and in the production and even in the character. One of these characters were thinking, what would happen if, and in the next slide, they're, they're together too. So it's the same, the same character. And it's like, what would happen if, if um, one of the characters from Fresi Chocolate would be living in Miami mm -hmm. now, would be in his what 40s 50s and would meet our protagonist that's that was it wasn't like that completely but for sure that was in the back of the mind of the actor and us when we were creating that character and this is the cafe right yeah this is uh, cafe, the books and books that was the first time that uh, ernesto meets uh, lenin yeah the same yeah. character that, that play is amazing about. actually it's a beautiful cafe yeah, yeah. It, it has a, a a really good vibe so and it's one of those that you see how much of the city played into the film and how mm -hmm. much is less of a background and is really a character uh, because our protagonist is unraveling Miami and the Cuba outside of Cuba and all of that. And this cafe yeah. is part of it. So we would go in with our little story of what the movie was all about and they would let us shoot there. So um, it, it's amazing. It was yeah. really, 
And it's good to present another kind of place in Miami because everybody thinks that Miami is just beach and buildings and the city and party and, and our character our character was to to a cafe just to read and, and, and take a coffee. Yeah, and reconnect yeah. with this culture and everything. So the, the Cuban Miami, which is different, a little yeah. different than the South Beach kind of more <laughs> party vibe. Gotcha. Gentlemen, I take my, my hat off to you, both of you, for the great job that you did. But we would be remiss if we did not run another cut of what we what you sent us. Get rolling, Tony. Tú sabes, yo tengo una de estas. Era de mi papá. Fue lo único que traje de Cuba. Muchachos, Hola. necesita gente para la construcción. No se preocupen por los papeles, no se los va a pedir. Can I see your uh, license and registration, please? Um, yeah. And his ID, too. Um, he's visiting me from Cuba. He doesn't have his passport on him. Bienvenido a Yuma, Natico! Speak English? No, he doesn't. I get. Tú sabes, yo tengo una de estas. Era de mi papá. Excellent, gentlemen. Excellent, excellent. I want to thank you both for being here today. Special thanks to Espada Public Relations, Jasmine Espada, the owner. You got a good lady there. Thank you very much. We'll <laughs> hear and see about you guys in the future. Thank you very much. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, thank Carlos you. Rafael Betancourt and Oscar Ernesto Ortega. Thank you both. Thank you both. Thank you. Have a great day. Have thank a good you. one. Bye. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you to our sponsors, Harvey Bram and Photography is an Art. Ron Irwin, haiku, style, passion, heart. Larry Buford's book to, book to the future, time travel, message in a capsule. State Farm agent Carla Green and veteran actor Rob Brownstein's actor training school and actor space. And much, much thanks to our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, singer, actress, vocal coach, and educator, Brell Hawkins. Actor, director, and artistic director, Ellen Gear, And director, writer, and, and editor, Carlos Rafael Betancourt along with cinematographer, writer, and director, Oscar Ernesto Ortega. And of course, special, special thanks to our ever-growing worldwide audience. We say be well, and we'll see you next time.